My name is Eva Ackermann Borje, and I'm the director of IOM's new department for policy and research. Migration Research and Publications Division, which is responsible for the production of the World Migration Report series and the organizers of this seminar, uh, webinar, I should say, is an important part of this uh, new department. And as you may know, the World Migration Report is IOM's flagship publication and the reference report on migration globally. It's uh, IOM's main contribution to strengthen global evidence based on migration and migrants worldwide to support states in policy formulation and review processes and combat disinformation on migration and migrants. The World Migration Report is published every two years and the latest edition, the World Migration Report 2022, was launched last year, 1st of December, by our Director General Antonio Vitorino at the 112th session of the IOM Council. We organized a first virtual event on the World Migration Report 2022 on 2nd December uh, 2021 with our Deputy Director General for Operations, Mrs. Ogochi Daniels. The first webinar pr provided um, an overview of the report and its digital tools. It was wild, widely attended, uh, <clears throat> reflecting an ever-growing interest for evidence-based information and analysis on migration and migrants by an increasingly diversified audience. We have the pleasure this year to organize a series of World Migration Report webinars to respond to the needs and interests of the report's audience. Each webinar will focus on a specific chapter of the World Migration Report, starting with the chapters of part one, which provide key data and information on migration and migrants, before turning to thematic chapters of part two, focusing on complex and emerging migration issues. Together with the <clears throat> different digital tools we have recently developed, such as the World Migration Educators Toolkit, these webinars are an important part of our endeavors to constantly improve the knowledge on migration and migrants globally. It's central to communicate research and analysis beyond the research community to a vast and diversified audience. And I'm very pleased to see attendees online not only from all over the world, but also from different backgrounds, ranging from government officials to practitioners to private sector actors and researchers, of course. Today's webinar will focus on chapter two of the World Migration Report 2022, which provides a global overview of migration and migrants. More specifically, the chapter explores global data and trends on international migrants, and international migration flows. It also provides a discussion of particular migrant groups, such as migrant workers, refugees, asylum seekers, and internally displaced persons, as well as of international remittances. As one of the core chapters of the World Migration Report, chapter two is updated in each edition in light of new data released by a range of organizations, including IOM's programmatic data on missing migrants, assisted voluntary return, reintegration, resettlement and displacement tracking. And in this 2022 edition, the chapter also explores the interconnections between migration and mobility in light of COVID-19 travel restrictions that have resulted in unprecedented immobility around the world. As one of the most used and cited chapters of the World Migration Report, Chapter 2 highlights how shifts in scale, in direction, demography and frequency can assist us in better understanding how migration is evolving, while also pointing to long-term trends that have been shaped by historical as well as recent events. The chapter also forms the basis of the World Migration Report interactive webpage, a dynamic digital platform with the data visualizations that allow 
users to explore and interact with some of the latest migration data and information. And I'm proud to say that in 2021, the interactive web page was recognized in two international design award competitions. So now, before passing the floor to our speakers, please let me remind you all that the webinar is recorded. In the interest of time, questions will be kept to the uh, Q&A session after the presentations and the remarks. However, please feel free to ask your questions at any time uh, during the webinar by using the, the chat function. So with that, I'm pleased to pass the floor now to Mary McAuliffe, who is the editor of the World Migration Report series and the head of the Migration Research and Publications Divisions at IOM. Please, Mari, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Eva. I'm just going to check and make sure that everybody can see the screen before I put it onto the slideshow. Can you see it okay? Yes, it works, Mary. Yeah, fantastic. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us and thanks especially to Amit Ichtigu and to Diego Iritalde for joining us as discussants. I'm looking forward to, to hearing from them later. But to start with, we'll just have a quick um, whiz through an overview of the Global Trends chapter, which as Eva mentioned, is really the core of the report. It is the most cited, the most used, and it provides the big picture every two years on, on international migration. So I will try and spend about um, 20 minutes and Eva is kindly going to wave at me or red card me or some or orange card me um, uh, on the way through if I take too long. But I will try and just really offer the highlights because there is the interactive platform, which is a lot more fun than a webinar but thank you again for joining us for this webinar. I know there's webinar fatigue. And there's also the report itself, which um, many people go through and use and search for key topics and keywords and so forth and use it in, in teaching, in their research, in policy briefs and all sorts of different things. So we're endeavoring to, to meet your needs um, in terms of uh, how you work um, on migration around the world. Just to recap, this is not how you do PowerPoint, obviously, there's way too much content here. But this is really important in terms of situating this edition of the World Migration Report within the last uh, 20 plus, 22 years, in fact. Uh, we just remind ourselves that um, migration uh, knowledge products and migration research and analysis has been around for a couple of decades, at least within IOM. Um, uh, but we have developed and honed and we engage in continuous improvement uh, within our team, within the organisation and also with our partners uh, to make sure that we are meeting the needs of, a, of an increasingly large but also diverse audience in regards to the World Migration Report as IOM's flagship. So it commenced in the year 2000. We publish it every two years, but if you look closely at those covers, you've seen it's been a bit higgly piggly, but we've tried to standardize that and produce a, a product that is a lot more predictable and, uh, and rigorous as well. It is a highly collaborative process. Um, we're involving many, many IOM staff from around the world who we greatly appreciate, but also with our external partners who help us with uh, co-authoring, who help us with co-editing, but also importantly with providing expert peer review. And, and we're greatly, uh, really, really deeply appreciative of their time and energy in helping us to produce a, a, a strong report. As um, Eva mentioned, we've won two awards last year, particularly in terms of design and the interactive platform. And we're also, as you can see there, expanding and tailoring different outputs uh, for different uh, audiences, including the Educators Toolkit, Fact Checkers Toolkit. We're currently working on the Policy Officials Toolkit with uh, GSPI and the Graduate Institute here in Geneva. I'm not going to read this out, but I'm just going to highlight really um, the importance of uh, the World Migration Report to contributing to uh, knowledge on migration around the world and really to talk about, I suppose, what our Director General highlights as IOM's obligation to demystify the complexity and diversity of human mobility, but also our obligation to make sure that we are providing accurate and clear 
um, data, information, research and analysis uh, to a growing um, and highly interested, of course, audience, notwithstanding politicisation and misinformation. Here is the report table of contents. Uh, it's rather large. We will be looking today just at chapter two, a global overview. We're trying to keep the webinars uh, short and keeping them to an hour. And we will be having webinars throughout the year, really looking at the various chapters in the World Migration Report, um, including with discussants. And we look forward to your questions um, a bit later. This one is the core chapter. It's chapter two on migration and migrants and provides a global overview. And we update this uh, chapter from edition to edition and have been doing it uh, this way since uh, 2018. So this is the third edition in the Global Reference Report um, series. Just a quick take on chapter one, which is the report overview. We do provide kind of almost like an executive summary in terms of the thematic uh, chapters, but we also look at the very, very big picture around global transformations that are occurring that do deeply affect um, international migration and displacement. And here I'm talking about the technological, the geopolitical, and also increasingly the environmental um, changes that we are seeing um, transform you know, a whole range of different global processes. In this particular edition, for the first time, we have provided some key migration data at a glance, again, in response to uh, readers' needs. And we've also really reflected on IOM's 70th anniversary. So for those who are interested in the organisational aspects, we do have a short summary in chapter one and then an appendix, which really looks at the regional offices um, around the world and their contributions. Now, to get to global trends, I'm not really going to go through this. Eva mentioned it earlier. We do look at sort of global data sets to try and situate um, the latest data uh, research and analysis on international migration. We do look at specific migrant groups, but it is important also, and you'll see it in text boxes throughout uh, the chapter, to situate IOM's programmatic and operational data. It may not be global, it may not have full coverage, but it can provide some very interesting highlights and information and analysis in terms of what is changing uh, around the world in regards to migration and its impacts on migrants and on member states and others. Um, this is, a, this is a static shot of the interactive. Uh, it, it's really just to highlight that we have invested with some key partners on providing a whole range of different types of outputs. This one is the one in 30. So we're really looking here at the international migrant population. I won't go to the interactive, but this is just to provide you with the web address and to give you a bit of a taster in terms of what the interactive covers. It doesn't cover the entire report, but it does cover some of the key outputs, especially from the global chapters, such as remittances, the COVID-19 restrictions. There is a fantastic Sankey um, interactive that I use actually on a day-to-day -day basis um, because it shows corridors, country-to-country uh, -country corridors um, around the world. It's very useful. There's um, a global map. We look at the accumulated uh, corridors as well as uh, one of the thematic chapters, which is the stepladder of opportunity. Now, some of the key questions. International migrants, where do they live? And you can hear, see here, we've looked at um, uh, data over time, 2005 through to 2020, taking snapshots. And you can see that uh, while the international migrant um, population has increased, it's certainly not even in number or proportion around the world. When we look at these six UN regions, we can see that Europe and Asia most definitely have the largest number of international migrants, but Asia has recorded the greatest growth over time since the year 2005. Just a reminder, many people on the call, and it's lovely to see the names pop up in terms of the participants. Um, thank you for joining us again. But many people on the call will know that here we're using UN DESA data and the definition of international migrant is not defined by policy category, but is defined by uh, being foreign born. So you're living in a country in which you were not born. International migrants, where did they live and where have they come from really? Um, here we're looking at the top uh, 20. This is snapshot data, the latest uh, international migrant data, again from UNDESA. 
And we can see um, the United States of America continues to be the most significant destination country uh, for international migrants. And then we can also see um, that Germany, Saudi Arabia, Russia Federation, the United Kingdom, so on and so forth, mainly labor migration, family reunification, uh, international students, of course. But we can also see some very large destination countries of which are affected by uh, refugee flows, such as Turkey. And we can see Turkey there as a top destination country around the world, and also the Syrian Arab Republic on the right hand side as one of the world's top origin countries, again, due to cross border displacement um, uh, in a very, very large uh, volume, unfortunately. We've got quite a few displacement countries, of course, in origin countries there, looking down the list, Afghanistan, uh, Venezuela, and so on. International migrants, where are the largest cumulative uh, country to country corridors? Now, this is um, snapshot data, but we have to remind ourselves, of course, that these are cumulative uh, corridors. So we could be looking at people who were born in one country, but have actually lived for decades um, in the country of destination, and they may even be citizens um, of that country. What we are looking at, just a reminder again, is that we're looking at foreign born here. So we can see that Mexico to the United States continues to be the world's largest cumulative country to country corridor, but then followed by Syria to Turkey. And again, we can see some very large um, corridors there that are due to uh, displacement, including Afghanistan, uh, of course, to uh, the Islamic Republic um, of Iran. But again, a real mix here of labor migration of a whole range of different policy categories of family reunification of displacement across borders and so on. Many of you will have uh, come across in the in the in the so-called literature in policy discussions um, the issue around the feminization of migration. But as we look at uh, the data over time, we can see that there has been significant growth in the number of female international migrants. However, the growth has not been as significant as the growth in male migrants. So it really calls into questions, uh, it calls into question the discussion around the feminization of migration. Why are we seeing these changes occur in the last 20 years in terms of uh, gender uh, splits? The sex disaggregation shows us very clearly that there is a growing gap in, um, in uh, gender uh, as it relates to international migrants. Some of the reasons relates to the big uh, corridors and the significant differences here when we're looking at this particular output, which is uh, from the ILO, and it's looking at migrant workers um, around the world. This is the latest data from the ILO on migrant workers as at 2019, highlighted uh, in the World Migration Report. And we can see here that while some regions have close to gender parity when we look at international migrants uh, disaggregated by sex, and here we're talking about um, Europe, uh, Central Asia, um, uh, other parts of the Central and Western Asia, I should say. Um, but then when we look at other parts of the world, we can see quite significant differences and some uh, geographic regions experience highly gendered um, migration resulting in very large sex differences and of course you can see at the top of the figure there the Arab states but also uh, southern Asia for example down towards the bottom has very significant differences with a much higher proportion of males compared to females. We do discuss this in the report, of course, and there are a range of different reasons, including occupations, uh, industries, uh, the conditions in uh, regards to international migration, but also the networks that can affect uh, destination patterns uh, over time. This is a new, unfortunately, fortunately, um, a new section within the World Migration Report, Chapter 2, because of COVID-19, of course, we have devoted a fair amount of space uh, within Chapter 2 to look at the impacts of COVID-19. 
Firstly, in regards to travel restrictions and these two graphs that you can see here, this pairing, the top is international uh, travel controls. Those terms, we've got large footnotes, of course, underneath our graphs, but those terms are ones from the Oxford government response tracker. So we're just being faithful to their um, particular concepts and terms. And there's certainly some uh, materials that you can read if you're interested in going into that. But the international travel controls at the top, and then the restrictions on internal movement between cities and regions at the bottom there. And you can see the top one, there are far uh, greater uh, numbers um, and proportions of, uh, of re international restrictions. This is by number of countries that have uh, restrictions in place. And here we're looking at from January 2020, and you can see the very significant uh, increase in, in restrictions in February and March, uh, really peaking um, in April. Yeah, most in, most particularly with the red zone being bans on all regions or total border closures. So there was a very strong reaction from uh, states around the world to putting in place um, international travel controls. You can see at the bottom similar sorts of um, dynamics. They're not as pronounced and certainly the internal movement restrictions uh, came down much more quickly and have softened um, over time. This significant via, uh, variation in terms of the imposition of travel restrictions by UN region, and uh, that is something that we can talk about in the next webinar when we look at the regional dimensions and developments, but just to highlight uh, there that there are significant differences. And of course, we did see the transition to the health related measures uh, over travel restrictions over time, particularly this is prevalent in uh, rich countries where they have high vaccination rates. And we know, of course, uh, from the World Health Organization that there has been a real disparity and inequality in terms of vaccination programming around the world. And that is reflected also in the nature, the type of the travel restrictions that we have seen uh, evolve over time. This is a rather dramatic graph. This is ICAO data, um, uh, the International Civil Aviation um, organization and they have uh, really tracked for a very long time 1945 through to 2020 the very significant impacts in terms of air passengers carried uh, globally I don't think a couple of years ago that any of us would have foreseen a graph like this an output like this we did see um, international uh, sorry total but domestic and international passenger numbers uh, drop from 2019 from 4.5 billion to 1.8 uh, billion around the world very significantly affecting of course uh, migrants who were stranded um, all around the world but also having impacts in regards to uh, health related impacts for people who are stranded Migrant workers became much more visible, of course, as essential workers in societies. And we did see an increase in digitalization, which is most um, obvious or quite sort of prevalent when we're looking at international remittances, of course, which is the next slide. Here, I'm just highlighting two graphs. This is the kind of the before and the after. Um, many of you may recall that uh, the initial uh, projection by the World Bank was that we would experience a 20% fall in international remittances globally due to COVID-19 for the year 2020, but the actual decline was 2.4%, highly uneven, of course, um, between uh, countries, but overall globally, it was a 2.4% um, decline. Some of the key factors related to, as highlighted earlier, the digitalization of financial transfers and also a move from informal channels, which hadn't been collected by um, uh, the data outputs previously, uh, into formal channels out of necessity. There, it was no longer possible if we look back towards 2020 and the very significant imposition of travel restrictions for people to be carrying cash home for religious events, for family events, for cultural events and so forth, um, uh, just to visit uh, family and friends. So they had to revert, especially from mid 2020, when it was clear that the pandemic was going to continue for some time, uh, there was a, a conversion into uh, digital channels and, and more formalized channels. We also know that migrants remit in times of crisis. We know this from previous, um, the global financial crisis, for example, and MERS and SARS impacts. 
um, in economic terms, they call it the counter cyclical effect. Uh, but we also know that the maturity of some of the key corridors enabled the established diaspora to be able to remit larger amounts in terms of uh, looking after family and friends. And then some countries did uh, experience better economic conditions uh, due to a range of different factors that were not initially foreseen at the beginning of 2020. Now Marie, we'll move on letting to... you know that you have three more minutes. Fantastic. Thanks, Eva, very much. I appreciate it. Um, there's a lot of material in here on some of the uh, refugee and asylum numbers, but the table that I thought we would sort of pull out, and we can get into a bit of a discussion about this, I'm sure, later, um, is not so much the headline figures and the trends. We do have that in, in, in the report, so I would encourage you to go and have a look. But a new table that we put in just to highlight the very significant disparity between um, resettlement needs and the resettlement arrivals. And we can see over time, uh, looking at UNHCR's data, of course, um, uh, a number of different outputs here, but we can see over time that while the resettlement needs uh, have, have grown, uh, we are definitely not keeping um, a pace in terms of the actual resettlement arrivals. And if we look at 2020, 34,383 arrivals, there is obviously um, a COVID-19 impact there as well uh, due to the travel restrictions. Nevertheless, it's very clear that there is this growing gap, a very significant gap um, uh, emerging it emerged some time ago, but it is continuing to become um, um, even, even larger between needs and resettlement arrivals of refugees. In terms of internal displacement, um, again, there's quite a few outputs um, on internal displacement from IDMC, the Internal uh, Displacement Monitoring Centre, of course, our colleagues at IDMC, and this one I've just highlighted because it shows at the top uh, here, we're looking at conflict and violence, new displacements in 2020. And at the bottom in the blue dots, we're looking at um, uh, internal displacements new in 2020 due to disaster. And here disaster can be uh, floods, uh, hurricanes, wildfires and so on. What we can see from this is the very significant difference in geography. Uh, 42 countries affected by conflict and violence, internal displacement compared to 144 countries um, affected by uh, internal displacements due to disasters. When we look at the stock, it's almost the reverse, um, including because often uh, conflict and violence IDPs or internally displaced persons are in protracted situations, whereas uh, uh, displacement due to disaster for a larger proportion uh, can result in um, return at once um, a disaster has um, abated and people can return to their homes. This is the interactive we have seen that before. I'm not going to highlight that anymore. And you've got the link uh, there and possibly in the chat too. And lastly, just um, a number of different outputs. We are working now on all six UN languages. So soon we will be able to finalize uh, translations into Arabic, Chinese, French, Russian, and Spanish. And we're also looking at key chapters being produced German is actually fully underway, but also in Bengali and Portuguese and uh, receiving calls and inquiries about um, having other translations uh, done, especially for developing country contexts, because as we know, officials need um, outputs in their official languages. So we look forward to working with our IOM colleagues and others going forward on that particular aspect. Thank you, Eva. Back to you. Well. Well, thank you so much to you, Mari, for this presentation of all the key findings of, of, of this chapter. And I mean, there are so many really interesting aspects in this. One that I wonder a lot about is, of course, this growing gender, gender gap and why it is happening. I think that's worth a lot of thought going forward. And obviously, of course, it uh, you know, goes without... Uh, mentioning really the, the the effects of the COVID-19 travel restrictions. What would that actually mean now in medium and longer term? I think that that's another really interesting 
a question that probably next edition will also, of course, uh, incorporate. So thank you again, Mari. I'm now pleased to introduce our first discussion, discussant uh, uh, of today. Uh, it's uh, Ahmed Uchguyu, who is a professor in both the Department of International Relations and that of sociology at Koch University, as well as the director of migration, the Migration Research Center, Miri Koch. Ahmed uh, was an academic reviewer for the World Migration Report 2022 and is a long-standing partner in migration research, including as part of our migration research and publishing high-level advices. Many thanks to you, Ahmed, for being here with us today. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, we sincerely appreciate your availability to share your expertise uh, and views on the World Migration Report 2022. Please, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Eva. Uh, thank, thank you, Mari, for this presentation. Uh, it's my pleasure to be a part of this event um, on the World Migration Report of 2022. Um, I will divide my next five minutes into two parts. Uh, first, uh, I will make some general, maybe some generic comments, highlighting to some of the uh, some of the points in this chapter. And the second, in the second part, actually, I will be more specific and probably a bit the original to to draw draw some conclusions out of this chapter. Uh, I read the, I mean, report and the uh, this chapter earlier, and the. Um, so let me start by saying that the, uh, this chapter, as it's already said, is with its title, it offers an overview of the um, global overview of the migrants and the migration flows around the world and the offers very valuable um, insights uh, into the very basic ind indicators of uh, migration and migrants. Uh, around the world, when I say basic indicators, we should not underestimate these important figures, although they look like simple things, but uh, uh, as a migration scholar, I know that we are having to, even for basic concepts like who is migrant, who is not at the long-term, short-term, temporary, permanent, uh, we have the different definitional problems and the plus, of course, the data. Always, uh, we, we know that the increasingly we are having more and more data, but the, one of the success of this volume, I believe that the, uh, it benefits out of the so many different sources from the UN, DESA, OECD, ILO, and the other sources. I know that it's quite difficult to compile the data from different sources, again, because of this definition, differences in the definitions and the systematically presenting them in a, in a, in a, in a chapter. So I, I must stress that this, this main problem of the migration studies, actual definitions and the data questions. So uh, from that perspective, actually, we, we, I really value this, this chapter and overall the, the report. This is the first point I, I like to make. Second point, when we look at the, uh, the figures, of course, it gives a kind of timeline to us and to what, what, what happens in recent years, also recent decades even. Uh, in that sense, why, why we are, what we are observing that they, with, in, with, on the different fields, uh, I will put it a bit rising importance and enlarging importance of the migration issues across the world. I mean, the different parts of the world, different ge ge geographies affected by differently, but overall we see that it is increasing quantities and also changes emerge throughout the periods. Uh, this, this was my second point. Third is that the uh, one significant point actually, uh, thanks to the IAM works, of course, there are some very, some focuses on, on particular issues, for instance, in this, uh, in, in this uh, report, focusing on the, this migration corridors, I, because in, in scholarly research we focus on, but the, here is presented uh, some, some graphs and the, this is very important. So there are some uh, reference to the IUMs, this programmatic data uh, on the safe uh, migration, unsafe migration, sorry, than the 
particular statistics on the deaths of the and lost life of the migrants. I, I believe this is very important uh, finding because these are the difficult fields to find the data. Uh, plus, of course, the um, IDPs and the uh, reference to the again the uh, IUM's displacement tracking matrix. These these are the something news and the not very valuable for the policymakers and the scholars and the students in the field of migration. So these are my general comments. Coming to the some specific issues, what I did actually when this I I got this task also I look at the. Um, the uh, World Migration Report of 2020 to see a bit difference in the same chapter uh, to compare a bit the, these two. And the, um, my, uh, I have uh, two, one significant observation, I believe it's significant because I noticed that the two concepts increasingly frequency of the, um, the two concepts is we, we see a kind of increasing from the 2020, 2022 reports reports. Uh, one is the concept of mobility. Actually, I find it very valuable. Of course, um, I did mention, of course, the, the uh, very significant part of this uh, chapter uh, devoted on the COVID, how the COVID environment affected the migration uh, flows and the situation with the migrants. Uh, this con the concept of the, this um, mobility came through this, this uh, in this context. But we know that the, from the scholarly research uh, over the last two decades, actually coming from different disciplines, we are trying to combine this, this mobility and migration concepts, okay? The kind of nexus there, linkages, continuation. And the, uh, oh, I heard this said that the measuring and the uh, migration is difficult. I, probably measuring mobility is much more difficult than the measuring migration. Uh, of course, seeing this linkage in the context of COVID is very important, uh, but uh, um, going, I think we should go beyond that. And in the in the coming years, the case probably highly likely we will discuss more and more mobility. How to measure the mobility? How mobility and the uh, migration interlink to each other? Uh, there are different views actually in the in the literature uh, on on uh, on these two concepts. Seeing them as a kind of continuation is something also they, uh, some scholars see that them as the a kind of opposing things. Uh, but certainly this is a kind of very significant field and the, what I will, um, what we should do at this, in the field, probably also in the coming uh, volumes of the, uh, the this World Migration Report, really we, probably we will devote more discussion on the mobility issues, how to measure the mobility, how to link the mobility issues, even the beyond the COVID environment, what I stress. So I observe, as I said, frequency of using this concept in the report. When I compare the 2020 report and 2022, I saw, I saw that I think in the 2020, in the same, same chapter only four four times we we, we had the uh, uh, mobility than the in the in the current one almost close to 40. So this is the first specific uh, thing I can say. The second thing is that the although maybe it's not so visible in this chapter, but overall in the whole report, another issue is the concept of digitalization or digitalization of migration, digital data, etc. In this chapter also we observe that, but the, throughout the whole report also we observe that. Finally, because the time is passing, I like to link these two issues together. Uh, certainly digitalization of the data, migration data is important and the uh, actual 2022 report overall give importance to that. But what I already mentioned, this mobility concept, I think uh, digitalization of the mi migration data uh, gives us a kind of opportunity really how we can measure the mobility is relatively easily. Also linking these two concepts, the mobility and digitalization and how we can use the digitalization, particularly in, the, in, in terms of the collecting data, even the, in terms of the interpretation of the data in the field and linking it to the mob mobility and migration, uh, again, will be very significant in coming years and the, deca the case. These, these are the two things actually I like to stress out of this chapter. Uh, I hope 
my comments wa was they were a bit complementary already what is said and the, uh, what is discussed in the chapter. I should stop here. Thank you very much again uh, for the time. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Ushtuyu, uh, for these very interesting remarks and, and, and your observation, I think, is very spot on also on the, the, the need to focus on the, this concept of mobility and unpacking that, uh, discussing how to measure and how to, to use it going forward. I think that this is a very interesting observation. So, Thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, now turn to our second discussant of today, Diego Iturralde, who is the Chief Director for Demography and Population Statistics at Statistics South Africa. Diego is responsible for the official population estimates published by Statistics South Africa, as well as for the thematic analysis and research related to mortality, fertility and migration. Many thanks, Diego, for wanting to be here with us today. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eva. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be on this call today and to uh, make a few comments on the chapter that has been presented uh, today. Um, I think I'd, I, I'd like to start off by uh, maybe picking up on the last point that was made um, and that would be around the type of indicators that have been produced in this, this chapter. I think we start off with looking at migrant stock broken down by certain key characteristics, but um, also highlighting the importance of mobility as it uh, is reflected in the new conceptual framework um, that the expert group on migration statistics has put together um, at the UNSD and which was approved by the UN Statistics Commission last year. Um, indeed, it, it is certainly more difficult to measure mobility and in different parts of the world, different um, modes of uh, measuring it and on collecting data on mobility will apply in some regions that wouldn't apply elsewhere. So it's it's very much uh, region and context um, specific. I, th I think the, the main thing that stands out to me in this report, uh, in this particular chapter, is the impact of um, COVID-19. Um, and I think it's no exaggeration to say that it is probably the one event that um, has shot the system in terms of the world where we live um, in all in, in all aspects and uh, needless to say in 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 the realm of international migration as well. I think those graphs showing the amount of um, international air travel that had dropped so significantly um, are the kind of graphs you would show your grandchildren one day and will ask what whatever happened there. Um, I do recall that in 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 2020, in the in the early part of the of the COVID-19 pandemic in South Africa, we we ran a short uh, online surveys, and um, one of the things we were looking at is to see to what extent movement um, out of the country as well as into the country would have been impacted, and uh, it was quite significant, as well as the the issue of remittances and to what extent were people intending to remit or or whether they simply had no no money to remit i think i think what stands out in this regard and i think marie made a a reference to that is the resilience of migrant communities that the the recovery in remittance rates was certainly a lot faster and a lot sooner than than anyone had anticipated um I don't think it's it's necessary for me to stress the importance of remittances because the, the, these are amounts of money which are are ext extremely large amounts of money which go to a person who who you are concerned about um, and this is not money that is being transferred to a government or to a organization for it to distribute but really a direct transfer to someone uh, who you care about and for whom uh, it will assist in improving their 
quality of life. So I think that the the recovery in remittances and the resilience of uh, migrants around the world is something that stood out for me. Um, I think the section then on uh, refugees and asylum seekers. Um, I think I think we 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 often when we think of migration we think of large groups of people moving between one region and the other, but I think it's it's also really important that we uh, take cognizance of the challenges and of the existence of refugees and asylum seekers. Um, I mean, we could speak about stateless um, individuals in this regard as well, uh, which would be, which would add a lot of value um, to this. Um, furthermore, I think that that uh, as as a research community, we we ought to focus on uh, well, not not focus instead of, but focus along alongside all of this in innovative data sources so that we are able to respond to critical policy issues. We are able to respond to them timelessly um, uh, using information, which may not be information that gets collected by a field worker or an administrative system, but is generated by individuals through their mobile phones or, th or through their um, internet searches on Google or something like that. And I think that exploring that domain is extremely useful, as well as exploring migration dynamics from a geospatial perspective. Um, so for the second part of my intervention, I, I, I just want to speak about dissemination, because I think it's fantastic that we collect and we produce all of this, but uh, we need to share this information. We need to make sure that it, it gets out there. Um, I, I, I'm forever asking Marie the question, how do we ensure that people use this information and make sure that it it reflects in in policies and, and programs that countries provide? Um, I think she, she almost anticipates me asking that question these days. Um, I think that in this regard, uh, we need to, to pay some special credit to the IOM for its international migration data portal, as well as the interactive page of the World Migration Report, because it, it really presents information in a digestible manner and in a manner which uh, we're able to understand. And it also provides a lot of additional information that non-migration specialists may not be aware of. Um, then the the expert group on migration statistics, I, I, th I think a lot of good work has, has gone in there as well. Besides the conceptual framework, there is work that's been concluded at this point in time around some key indicators that are relevant for um, migration policy. Um, in, the, in the same vein, the IDAC, the International Data Alliance for Children on the Move, which is um, coordinated by the OECD, the IOM and UNICEF, um, also has, has got a few working groups going together. Uh, I'm chairing the one that's looking at indicators. So in a similar way, we are looking at what are the key indicators that um, would be necessary to inform policy with regards to child migration. Um, then finally, I want to perhaps wrap up um, speaking about some initiatives closer to home. Um, we all we all speak about migration governance being an all of government um, approach, but uh, I don't think we we ever we we ever um, put this into practice when it comes to data and research. Many many migration coordinating committees. Uh, are in existence around the world with regards to policies and how how are certain challenges going to be managed, but never so much with regards to the collection and the analysis of information collected. So in South Africa, we've established a National Migration and Urbanization Forum, which does exactly this. It brings along, brings together people from various uh, government entities, civil society, even international organizations to share data and findings around migration, which will hopefully find resonance in the policy space. And um, I think that a report like this um, certainly plays a big role in painting a bigger picture of what is it that we are observing at a, at a global level. But I, I, 
finally, I would like to just close um, by highlighting some misconceptions about migration from a chapter which was co-authored by myself and Jonathan Crush. Um, it deals specifically with um, migration in the Southern African region. But I, I, I think that some of the misconceptions that we try to clarify here certainly play a big role at the global level as well. So there are six of these misconceptions. The, the, the first one is that migration has increased exponentially since 1990. And I think that if we, we look at some of the world migration reports from, from 2000, we, we can see that it's, it certainly has increased significantly. Uh, but to speak of an of exponential um, growth of migration is 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 not accurate. Um, we must also take into account the definition of migrants, which I think was um, was emphasised, and that uh, what does it include and what does it exclude um, in 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 order to make that kind of a comment. The second misconception are that countries are either countries of origin or destination. And I think we find around the world that uh, a country can be one of origin and destination, as well as a country of transit. Um, so to label countries as one or the other or place them into a box is also not, not an, an accurate representation. Thirdly, um, migrants are arriving from other countries and other regions in overwhelming numbers. Um, this this also is an, an exaggeration. Perhaps it's part of the the um, on, on, ongoing rhetoric, uh, which is aligned with anti-migrant sentiment um, that speaks to the stealing of jobs the, and the existence of all social ills being blamed on on migrant communities. Uh, so I think as a research community, we have a a inalienable responsibility to occupy the space and insert um, evidence which which uh, puts these that corrects these things and and um, places facts into the public space. The fourth misconception is that migrants are dominated by young male migrants, and I, I think the report goes to some length to emphasise the feminization of migration over time. Um, even if even even if we look at it on a country by country basis, uh, we can see that over time the number of um, female migrants migrating independently of uh, their male partners um, has 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 increased. Um, then the fifth misconception is that um, countries are being flooded with an influx of refugees and asylum seekers. And uh, most certainly this, this, this is not the case. There are certainly times in our history where um, there have been an increase in, in refugees as a, as a result of uh, global conflicts. Um, and, uh, and these things may occur from time to time, but if we, if we look at, a, at it with a long-term lens, then it, it certainly does not point to that particular picture. And then finally, the last misconception which we want to clarify um, is that migrants are largely unskilled and work in primary industries. And I think if we look at any, any country's labor migration reports, we can see that there's a wide variety of skills uh, from the highly skilled to the unskilled uh, within the labor migrant population. So I, th I think I've I've exceeded my five minutes, but um, I think I'll leave it at that and welcome to answer any further questions. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Diego, for for all these uh, important and 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 interesting observations that you have made. Many many things to pick up there uh, with your re reflections, not least uh, from. Uh, my point of view, the need to disseminate this information and data. I mean, basically, that's a broad, big question, but I think that that is important. And I know that this is also a, a, an issue that Mari and her team are thinking a lot about and, you know, how to how to to speak about data and analysis and evidence to policymakers, for instance, what, you know, what is the magic key to 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 get through? And I think that that's 
really important. And I think it also speaks to your myth busting there, those six uh, areas that, that, that you mentioned. So thank you very much for, uh, for that. We are running a little bit out of time and I don't know how strict we are uh, with uh, time uh, keeping here. Um, if I can indulge our, our participants for another three, four, five minutes, I, I'd like to just raise uh, uh, two questions that are quite close to each other and ask the panelists to make like one minute <laughs> responses each <laughs> to, to this if you want. And actually the interest from, from those who have put questions in the, in, in the chat has been quite uh, around digitalization. Uh, so the, fir the, the, the first question here that, uh, that comes out is when talking about digitalization of migration data, do you think we are at a stage where big data will be featured in the 2024 edition? And if so, you know, what were the sources and data sets that could be of, of, of interest to, to, to focus on? That's the first part of the question. The second part is uh, on digitalization and remittances. And as <clears throat> we've seen that uh, there has, has uh, the question is, has there been a significant turn to technical digital solutions used by migrants to send back international remittances during the pandemic. I mean, when we've seen the resilience that you also pointed to Diego uh, uh, about remittances, uh, has this been much more than towards digital solutions? And do we know anything about what type of solutions were mostly used? So those are the two, two questions that unfortunately, this is the, the, the time we have uh, and I'll, I'll uh, uh, send it back to, 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 to the panelists. And maybe if I ask Mari to, to start off, please, Mary. Sure, thanks, Eva, very much. And I'll be very, very quick. We do a lot of work on um, sort of digitalization and digital technology, including, as Armit mentioned, uh, throughout the rest of the report. So people who are interested in, in these particular aspects, I would encourage you to, to join um, uh, future webinars where we look at, you know, especially artificial intelligence, but a whole range of different um, impacts. In regards to the second question, I'll answer that one first, and um, international remittances. We do look at this in the COVID-19 chapter. There is a thematic chapter that we, um, we worked on with a number of different researchers. And of course, international remittances uh, has been a significant issue in regards to COVID-19. And there are some kind of examples of member states, for example, um, putting in place uh, digital channels and really ramping up existing programs to try and get people um, through more formal channels as well as digital channels. And then there are a number of examples that we highlight by various providers, mobile money um, providers, uh, to encourage people to remit, um, given the difficulties, uh, fee-free arrangements occurring in different parts of the world, of course. The big focus is to reduce remittance costs in accordance with the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. And this is where um, COVID-19, as we talk about in, in the first chapter, the overview chapter, has really sort of turbocharged digitalization, which can be for good. And we can see mobile money applications and service providers reducing costs and making things not just cheaper and faster, but also safer for many migrants around the world. So digitalization can be of significant benefit, as we saw in terms of international remittances. So I would encourage people to have a look at uh, chapter five, which is the COVID-19 thematic chapter. In regards to uh, digitalization and, and mobility, we flagged it kind of in the 2020 report, but we hadn't, I don't think anybody, because it was released at the end of 2019, in, end of November, before COVID-19 hit. And we drew on um, a fantastic paper that um, Professor Ron Skeldon uh, wrote for us for the Migration Research Series on the concepts and the, the challenges around migration and mobility. So I would encourage people to read that. But we looked at that in much more detail, as Amit mentioned, in regards to the current report because of the COVID-19 um, impacts. And we know that um, as we saw with some of the large uh, tech providers, uh, um, we did see mobility data increase 
um, for public good, for example, in regards to managing COVID-19 measures. But there are real challenges because it's not necessarily global data sets. It doesn't necessarily include all geographies or all demographics, more importantly, when we're looking at um, digital um, inputs and digital data around mobility, especially from um, call data records, CDRs, but also from mobile phone applications and usage where you have history turned on and so forth. So we know some of those challenges. Uh, it's nothing is perfect. So there's certainly some rich material to work with, but I think the providers, uh, certainly the users of the data are very much aware of the limitations, but also in the potential benefits in terms of looking at some of this data for analytical purposes. Um, but we do need to be um, very conscious, is including in relation to the Statistical Commission, what is feasible and making sure that we're not um, embedding uh, or systematizing global inequalities for those uh, geographies, for those people who don't have access or those demographic groups, the older groups who don't necessarily use um, devices, uh, use um, technology in the same way as well. So we're not just looking at geography, we're also looking at um, demographics. So yes, there is certainly an increase in digital data, but we have to be very mindful and careful about how it is used and how it is analysed. Thanks. Way over. Sorry. It's 5.03. <laughs> that was my short answer. I don't think yes, you want to hear thank my long answer. <laughs> I, know, I know that. <laughs> thank you very much, Mari. Can I please turn to, to, to Ahmed? Please let us. Well, I mean, time is already over. Yes. But again, I will stress that really, particularly to measure the mobility, to better understand the mobility, I believe that the use of digital data in the coming years and the case will be very important and we should work on that too, particularly link, putting linkage between mobility and migration issues. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And now please, Diego. Thank you. Um, so I, I think that um, digital data sources are already quite a, a strong reality. I think they are, they are being collected uh, by numerous ent um, entities. And uh, I certainly think that this, this is an, an opportunity in the migration space. I, I, I made a very brief reference to geospatial techniques of measuring migration and mobility. And I think that there's a lot of, a lot of opportunity there as well. But uh, as a representative from a national statistics office, I think it's important to acknowledge the limitations of, of these uh, big data sources and to establish uh, techniques or methods to normalize them and to use them with responsibility. Um, how, how do we adjust them in order for them to be representative of a total population? So I think that's with regards to the, the digital sources. With regards to digital remittances, I, I think the key thing here is cost. Um, if uh, digital solutions can provide a cheaper, alternative to sending money through the current uh, channels. Um, it will certainly take off. In Southern Africa, the uh, remittance costs are probably one of the highest around in the world. And this is why, why we see in-person uh, transfers as well as informal transfers uh, taking place, which, which unfortunately do not feature in the balance of national accounts data which the World Bank uh, draws on. So um, I think there is opportunity in digital remittances, but uh, I think the overwhelming factor here is what the cost would be. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And, and with that, we are well well established over time. <laughs> we have run a little bit over time, but I would like to take this opportunity to thank everybody for joining this uh, uh, webinar. Thank you for the questions and thank you very much. A special thank you to our two discussions that were with us today, Ahmed and Diego. We very much appreciate your, your participation. So thank you very much for that. I just want to remind you of a couple of things. If you haven't done it already, let me invite you to go to chapter two of the World Migration Report and the World Migration Report interactive webpage. I think that is really worth your while. And I also want to remind you that we will continue this webinar series and have the next webinar uh, taking place on the 16th of March at four <coughs> o'clock Central European time. And 
<clears throat> you will be able to see the, the, the flyer and the invitation of registration for this in the, in, in the chat. So we really hope that you will be able to join us on the 16th of March and please feel free to email the, the WMR team uh, at the email address that is provided in the chat. So if you have any questions about that. And with that, I would like to say thank you very much again. And I wish all of you a nice rest of your day. Bye.